Jailbird by Kurt Vonnegut. Part 4, chapters 13 through 18. Read by Ron Gabaldon. 13. I was about to say to him gravely, watchfully, but sincerely, How are you, Leland? It's good to see you again. But I never got to say it. The shopping bag lady, whose voice was loud and piercing, cried out, Oh my God! Walter F. Starbuck! Is that really you? I do not intend to reproduce her accent on the printed page. I thought she was crazy. I thought that she would have parroted any name Clues chose to hang on me. If he had called me Bumptious Q. Bangwhistle, I thought, she would have cried, Oh my God! Bumptious Q. Bangwhistle! Is that really you? Now she began to lean her shopping bags against my legs, as though I were a convenient fire plug. There were six of them, which I would later study at leisure. They were from the most expensive stores in town. Henri Bendel, Tiffany's, Sloan's, Bergdorf Goodman, Bloomingdale's, Abercrombie & Fitch. All but Abercrombie & Fitch, incidentally, which would soon go bankrupt, were subsidiaries of the Ramjack Corporation. Her bags contained mostly rags, pickings from garbage cans. Her most valuable possessions were in her basketball shoes. I tried to ignore her, even as she entrapped me with her bags. I kept my gaze on the face of Leland Clues. You're looking well, I said. I'm feeling well, he said. And so is Sarah, you'll be happy to know. I'm glad to hear it, I said. She's a very good girl. Sarah was no girl anymore, of course. Clues told me now that she was still doing a little nursing as a part-time thing. I'm glad, I said. To my horror, I felt as though a sick bat had dropped from the eaves of a building and landed on my wrist. The shopping bag lady had taken hold of me with her filthy little hand. This is your wife, he said. My what, I said. He thought I had sunk so low that this awful woman and I were a pair. I never saw her before in my life, I said. Oh, Walter, 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 she keened. How can you say such a thing? I pried her hand off me, but the instant I returned my attention to clues, she snapped it onto my wrist again. Pretend she isn't here, I said. This is crazy. She has nothing to do with me. I will not let her spoil this moment, which means a great deal to me. Oh, Walter, 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 she said. What has become of you? You're not the Walter F. Starbuck I knew. That's right, I said, because you never knew any Walter F. Starbuck. But this man did. And I said to Clues, I suppose you know that I myself have spent time in prison now. Yes, he said. Sarah and I were very sorry. I was let out only yesterday morning, I said. You have some trying days ahead, he said. Is there somebody to look after you? I'll look after you, Walter, said the shopping bag lady. She leaned closer to me to say that so fervently, and I was nearly suffocated by her body odor and her awful breath. Her breath was laden not only with the smell of bad teeth, but, as I would later realize, with finely divided droplets of peanut oil. She had been eating nothing but peanut butter for years. You can't take care of anybody, I said to her. Oh, you'd be surprised what all I could do for you, she said. Leland, I said. All I want to say to you is that I know what jail is now. And God damn it, the thing I'm sorriest about in my whole life is that I had anything to do with sending you to jail. Well, he said, Sarah and I have often talked about what we would like to say most to you. I'm sure, I said. And it's this, he said. Thank you very much, Walter. My going to prison was the best thing that ever happened to Sarah and me. I'm not joking. Word of honor. It's true. I was amazed. How can that be, I said. Because life is supposed to be a test, he said. If my life had kept going the way it was going, I would have arrived in heaven never having faced any problem that wasn't as easy as pie to solve. St. Peter would have had to say to me, You never lived, my boy. Who can say what you are? I see, I said. Sarah and I not only have love, he said, but we have love that has stood up to the hardest tests. It sounds very beautiful, I said. We would be proud to have you see it, he said. Could you come to supper sometime? Yes, I suppose, I said. Where are you staying, he said. The Hotel Arapaho, I said. 
I thought they'd torn that down years ago, he said. No, I said. You'll hear from us, he said. I look forward to it, I said. As you'll see, he said, we have nothing in the way of material wealth, but we need nothing in the way of material wealth. That's intelligent, I said. I'll say this, though, he said. The food is good. As you may remember, Sarah is a wonderful cook. I remember, I said. And now the shopping bag lady offered the first proof that she really did know a lot about me. You're talking about that Sarah Wyatt, aren't you, she said. There was a silence among us, although the uproar of the metropolis went on and on. Neither Clues nor I had mentioned Sarah's maiden name. I finally managed to ask her, woozy with shapeless misgivings. How do you know that name? She became foxy and coquettish. You think I don't know you were two-timing me with her the whole time, she said. Given that much information, I no longer needed to guess who she was. I had slept with her during my senior year at Harvard, while still squiring the virginal Sarah Wyatt to parties and concerts and athletic events. She was one of the four women I had ever loved. She was the first woman with whom I had had anything like a mature sexual experience. She was the remains of Mary Kathleen O'Looney. 14. I was his circulation manager, said Mary Kathleen to Leland Clues very loudly. Wasn't I a good circulation manager, Walter? Yes, you certainly were, I said. That was how we met. She presented herself at the tiny office of the Bay State Progressive in Cambridge at the start of my senior year saying that she would do absolutely anything I told her to do, as long as it would improve the condition of the working class. I made her circulation manager, put her in charge of handing out the paper at factory gates and along bread lines and so on. She had been a scrawny little thing back then, but tough and cheerful and highly visible because of her bright red hair. She was such a hater of capitalism because her mother was one of the women who died of radium poisoning after working for the Wyatt Clock Company. Her father had gone blind after drinking wood alcohol while a night watchman in a shoe polish factory. Now what was left of Mary Kathleen bowed her head, responded modestly to my having agreed that she had been a good circulation manager, and presented her pate to Leland Clues and me. She had a bald spot about the size of a silver dollar. The tonsure that fringed it was sparse and white. Leland Clues would tell me later that he almost fainted. He had never seen a woman's bald spot before. It was too much for him. He closed his blue eyes and he turned away. When he manfully faced us again, he avoided looking directly at Mary Kathleen, just as the mythological Perseus had avoided looking at the Gorgon's head. We must get together soon, he said. Yes, I said. You'll be hearing from me soon, he said. I hope so, I said. Must rush, he said. I understand, I said. Take care, he said. I will, I said. He was gone. Mary Kathleen's shopping bags were still banked around my legs. I was as immobilized and eye-catching as St. Joan of Arc at the stake. Mary Kathleen still grasped my wrist, and she would not lower her voice. Now that I've found you, Walter, she cried, I'll never let you go again. Nowhere in the world was this sort of theater being done anymore. For what it may be worth to modern impresarios, I can testify from personal experience that great crowds can still be gathered by melodrama, provided that the female in the piece speaks loudly and clearly. You used to tell me all the time how much you loved me, Walter, she cried. But then you went away, and I never heard from you again. Were you just lying to me? I may have made some responsive sound. Blah, perhaps, or fluh. Look at me in the eye, Walter, she said. Sociologically, of course, this melodrama was as gripping as Uncle Tom's Cabin before the Civil War. Mary Kathleen O'Looney wasn't the only shopping bag lady in the United States of America. There were tens of thousands of them in major cities throughout the country. Ragged regiments of them had been produced accidentally and to no imaginable purpose by the great engine of the economy. Another part of the machine was spitting out unrepentant murderers ten years old and dope fiends and child batterers and many other bad things. People claimed to be investigating, 
Unspecified repairs were to be made at some future time. Good-hearted people were, meanwhile, as sick about all these tragic byproducts of the economy as they would have been about human slavery a little more than a hundred years before. Mary Kathleen and I were a miracle that our audience must have prayed for again and again. The rescue of at least one shopping bag lady by a man who knew her well. Some people were crying. I myself was about to cry. Hug her, said a woman in the crowd. I did so. I found myself embracing a bundle of dry twigs that was wrapped in rags. That was when I myself began to cry. I was crying for the first time since I had found my wife dead in bed one morning, in my little brick bungalow in Chevy Chase, Maryland. 15. My nose, thank God, had conked out by then. Noses are merciful that way. They will report that something smells awful. If the owner of a nose stays around anyway, the nose concludes that the smell isn't so bad after all. It shuts itself off, deferring to superior wisdom. Thus, is it possible to eat Limburger cheese, or to hug the stinking wreckage of an old sweetheart at the corner of 5th Avenue and 42nd Street? It felt for a moment as though Mary Kathleen had died in my arms. To be perfectly frank, that would have been all right with me. Where, after all, could I take her from there? What could be better than her receiving a hug from a man who had known her when she was young and beautiful, and then going to heaven right away? It would have been wonderful. Then again, I would never have become executive vice president of the Down Home Records Division of the Ramjack Corporation. I might at this very moment be sleeping off a wine binge in the Bowery while a juvenile monster soaked me in gasoline and touched me off with his cricket lighter. Mary Kathleen now spoke softly. God must have sent you, she said. There, there, I said. I went on hugging her. There's nobody I can trust any more, she said. Now, now, I said. Everybody's after me, she said. They want to cut off my hands. There, there, I said. I thought you were dead, she said. No, no, I said. I thought everybody was dead but me, she said. There, there, I said. I still believe in the revolution, Walter, she said. I'm glad, I said. Everybody else lost heart, she said. I never lost heart. Good for you, I said. I've been working for the revolution every day, she said. I'm sure, I said. You'd be surprised, she said. Get her a hot bath, said somebody in the crowd. Get some food in her, said somebody else. The revolution is coming, Walter, sooner than you know, said Mary Kathleen. I have a hotel room where you can rest a while, I said. I have a little money, not much, but some. Money, she said, and she laughed. Her scornful laughter about money had not changed. It was exactly as it had been forty years before. Shall we go? I said. My room isn't far from here. I know a better place, she said. Get her some one-a-day vitamins, said somebody in the crowd. Follow me, Walter, said Mary Kathleen. She was growing strong again. It was Mary Kathleen who now separated herself from me, and not the other way around. She became raucous again. I picked up three of her bags, and she picked up the other three. Our ultimate destination, it would turn out, was the very top of the Chrysler Building, the quiet showroom of the American Harp Company up there. But first we had to get the crowd to part for us, and she began to call people in our way capitalist fats and bloated plutocrats and bloodsuckers and all that again. Her means of locomotion in her gargantuan basketball shoes was this. She barely lifted the shoes from the ground, shoving one forward and then the other, like cross-country skis, while her upper body and shopping bag swiveled wildly from side to side. But that oscillating old woman could go like the wind. I panted to keep up with her, once we got clear of the crowd. We were surely the cynosure of all eyes. Nobody had ever seen a shopping bag lady with an assistant before. When we got to Grand Central Station, Mary Kathleen said that we had to make sure we weren't being followed. She led me up and down escalators, ramps, and stairways, looking over her shoulders for pursuers all the time. We scampered through the oyster bar three times. She brought us at last to an iron door at the end of a dimly lit corridor. We surely were alone. Our hearts were beating hard. 
When we had recovered our breaths, she said to me, I am going to show you something you mustn't tell anybody about. I promise, I said. This is our secret, she said. Yes, I said. I had assumed that we were as deep in the station as anyone could go. How wrong I was. Mary Kathleen opened the iron door on an iron staircase going down, down, down. There was a secret world as vast as Carlsbad Caverns below. It was used for nothing anymore. It might have been a sanctuary for dinosaurs. It had, in fact, been a repair shop for another family of extinct monsters, locomotives driven by steam. Down the steps we went. My God, what majestic machinery there must have been down there at one time. What admirable craftsmen must have worked there. In conformance with fire laws, I suppose, there were light bulbs burning here and there, and there were little dishes of rat poison set around. But there were no other signs that anyone had been down there for years. This is my home, Walter, she said. Your what? I said. You wouldn't want me sleeping outdoors, would you? She said. No, I said. Be glad then, she said, that I have such a nice and private home. I am, I said. You not only talked to me, you hugged me, she said. That's how I knew I could trust you. Um, I said. You're not after my hands, she said. No, I said. You know there are millions of poor souls out on the street looking for a toilet somebody will let them use, she said. I suppose that's true, I said. Look at this, she said. She led me into a chamber that contained row on row of toilets. It's good to know they're here, I said. You won't tell anybody, she said. No, I said. I'm putting my life in your hands telling you my secrets like this, she said. I'm honored, I said. And then out of the catacombs we climbed. She led me through a tunnel under Lexington Avenue and up a staircase into the lobby of the Chrysler Building. She skied across the floor to a waiting elevator with me trotting behind. A guard shouted at us, but we got into the elevator before he could stop us. The doors shut in his angry face as Mary Kathleen punched the button for the topmost floor. We had the car all to ourselves, and upward we flew. Within a trice, the doors slithered open on a place of unearthly beauty and peace within the building's stainless steel crown. I had often wondered what was up there. Now I knew. The crown came to a point seventy feet above us. Between us and the point, as I looked upward in awe, there was nothing but a lattice of girders and air, air, air. What a glorious waste of space, I thought. But then I saw that there were tenants after all. Myriads of bright yellow little birds were perched on the girders, or flitting through the prisms of light admitted by the bizarre windows, by the great triangles of glass that pierced the crown. The vast floor at whose edge we stood was carpeted in grassy green. There was a fountain splashing at its center. There were garden benches and statues everywhere, and here and there a harp. As I have already said, this was the showroom of the American Harp Company which had recently become a subsidiary of the Ramjack Corporation. The company had occupied this space since the building opened in 1931. All the birds I saw, which were prothonotary warblers, were descended from a single pair released back then. There was a Victorian gazebo near the elevator, which contained the desks of the salesman and his secretary. A woman was sobbing in there. What a morning it was for tears! What a book this is for tears. The oldest man I had ever seen came tottering out of the gazebo. He wore a swallowtail coat and striped trousers and spats. He was the sole salesman, and had been since 1931. He was the man who had released from the hot cage of his hands and into this enchanted space the first two prothonotary warblers. He was ninety-two years old. He looked like John D. Rockefeller at the end of his life, or like a mummy. The only moisture left in him, seemingly, was faint dew on the surface of his eyes. He was not entirely defenseless, however. He was president of a pistol club that shot at targets shaped like men on weekends, and he had a loaded luger the size of a Doberman pincher in his desk. He had been looking forward to a robbery for quite some time. 
Oh, it's you, he said to Mary Kathleen. And she said that, yes, it was. She was accustomed to coming here almost every day and sitting for several hours. The understanding was that she was to get out of sight with her shopping bags in case a customer came in. There was a further understanding which Mary Kathleen had now violated. I thought I told you, he said to her, that you were never to bring anybody else with you, or even to tell anybody else how nice it was up here. Since I was carrying three shopping bags, he concluded that I was another derelict, a shopping bag man. He isn't a bum, said Mary Kathleen. He's a Harvard man. He did not believe this for a minute. I see, he said, and he looked me up and down. He himself had never even graduated from grammar school, incidentally. There had been no laws against child labor when he was a boy, and he had gone to work in the Chicago factory of the American Harp Company at the age of ten. I've heard that you can always tell a Harvard man, he said, but you can't tell him much. I never thought there was anything special about Harvard men, I said. That makes two of us, he said. He was being most unpleasant, and clearly wanted me out of there. This is not the Salvation Army, he said. This was a man born during the presidency of Grover Cleveland. Imagine that. He said to Mary Kathleen, Really, I'm most disappointed in you bringing somebody else along. Should we expect three tomorrow, and twenty the day after that? Christianity does have its limits, you know. I now made a blunder that would land me back in El Calabozo before noon on what was to have been my first full day of freedom. As a matter of fact, I said, I'm here on business. You wish to buy a harp, he said. There's seven thousand dollars and up, you know. How about a kazoo instead? I was hoping you could advise me, I said, as to where I could buy clarinet parts. Not whole clarinets, but just clarinet parts. I was not serious about this. I was extrapolating a business fantasy from the contents of my bottom drawer at the Arapaho. The old man was secretly electrified. Thumbtacked to the bulletin board in the gazebo was a circular that advised him to call the police in case anyone expressed interest in buying or selling clarinet parts. As he would later tell me, he had stuck it up there months before. Like a lottery ticket bought in a moment of folly. He had never expected to win. His name was Delmar Peel. Delmar was nice enough later on to make me a present of the circular, which I hung on my office wall at Ramjack. I became his superior in the Ramjack family, since American Harp was a subsidiary of my division. I was certainly no superior of his the first time we met, though. He played cat and mouse with me. Many clarinet parts or a few? he asked cunningly. Quite a few, actually, I said. I realize that you yourself don't handle clarinets. You've come to the right place all the same, he hastened to assure me. I know everyone in the business. If you and Madam X would like to make yourselves comfortable, I would be glad to make some telephone calls. You're too kind, I said. Not at all, he said. Madam X, incidentally, was the only name he had for Mary Kathleen. That was what she had told him her name was. She had simply barged in one day, trying to escape from people she thought were after her. He had worried a lot about shopping bag ladies, and he was a practicing Christian, so he had let her stay. Meanwhile, the sobbing in the gazebo was abating some. Delmar conducted us to a bench far from the gazebo, so we could not hear him call the police. He had us sit down. Comfy? he said. Yes, thank you, I said. He rubbed his hands. How about some coffee? he said. It makes me too nervous, said Mary Kathleen. With sugar and cream if it's not too much trouble, I said. No trouble at all, he said. What's the trouble with Doris, said Mary Kathleen. That was the name of the secretary who was crying in the gazebo. Her full name was Doris Cram. She herself was 87 years old. At my suggestion, People Magazine recently did a story on Delmar and Doris as being almost certainly the oldest boss and secretary team in the world, and perhaps in all history. It was a cute story. One picture showed Delmar with his Luger and quoted him to the effect that anyone who tried to rob the American Harp Company, quote, 
would be one unhappy robber pretty quick. End quote. He told Mary Kathleen now that Doris wept because she had had two hard blows in rapid succession. She had been notified on the previous afternoon that she was going to have to retire immediately now that Ramjack had taken over. The retirement age for all Ramjack employees everywhere except for supervisory personnel was 65. And then that morning, while she was cleaning out her desk, she got a telegram saying that her great-grandniece had been killed in a head-on collision after a high school senior prom in Sarasota, Florida. Doris had no descendants of her own, he explained, so her collateral relatives meant a lot to her. Delmar and Doris, incidentally, did almost no business up there, and continue to do almost no business up there. I was proud when I became a Ramjack executive that American harp company harps were the finest harps in the world. You would have thought that the best harps would come from Italy or Japan or West Germany by now, with American craftsmanship having become virtually extinct. But no, musicians even in those countries, and even in the Soviet Union, agreed. Only an American harp company harp can cut the mustard. But the harp business is not, and can never be, a volume business, except in heaven, perhaps. So the profit picture, the bottom line, was ridiculous. It was so ridiculous that I recently undertook an investigation of why Ramjack had ever acquired American Harp. I learned that it was in order to capture the incredible lease on the top of the Chrysler building. The lease ran until the year 2031, at a rent of $200 a month. Arpad Lean wanted to turn the place into a restaurant. That the company also owned a factory in Chicago with 65 employees was a mere detail. If it could not be made to show a substantial profit within a year or two, Ramjack would close it down. Peace. 16. Mary Kathleen O'Looney was, of course, the legendary Mrs. Jack Graham, the majority stockholder in the Ramjack Corporation. She had her ink pad and pens and writing paper in her basketball shoes. Those shoes were her bank vaults. Nobody could take them off of her without waking her up. She would claim later that she had told me who she really was on the elevator. I could only reply, If I had heard you say that, Mary Kathleen, I surely would have remembered it. If I had known who she really was, all her talk about people who wanted to cut off her hands would have made a lot more sense. Whoever got her hands could pickle them and throw away the rest of her and control the Ramjack Corporation with just her fingertips. No wonder she was on the run. No wonder she dared not reveal her true identity anywhere. No wonder she dared not trust anybody. On this particular planet, where money mattered more than anything, the nicest person imaginable might suddenly get the idea of wringing her neck so that their loved ones might live in comfort. It would be the work of the moment, and easily forgotten as the years went by. Time flies. She was so tiny and weak. Killing her and cutting off her hands would have been little more horrifying than what went on 10,000 times a day at a mechanized chicken farm. Ramjack owns Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Fried Chicken, of course. I have seen that operation as it looks backstage. About my not having heard her say she was Mrs. Jack Graham on the elevator, I do remember that I had trouble with my ears toward the top of the elevator ride because of the sudden change in altitude. We shot up about a thousand feet with no stops on the way. Also, temporarily deaf or not, I had my conversational automatic pilot on. I was not thinking about what she was saying or what I was saying either. I thought that we were both so far outside the mainstream of human affairs that all we could do was comfort each other with animal sounds. I remember her saying at one point that she owned the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and I thought I had not heard her right. I'm glad, I said. So, as I sat beside her on the bench in the Harp showroom, she thought I had a piece of key information about her, which I did not have. And Delmar Peel had meanwhile called the police and had also sent Doris Cram out, supposedly for coffee, but really to find a policeman out on the street somewhere. As it happened, there was a small riot going on in the park adjacent to the United Nations only three blocks away. Every available policeman was over there. Out-of-work white youths armed with baseball bats were braining men they thought were homosexuals. They threw one of them in the East River, who turned out to be the finance minister of Sri Lanka. 
I would meet some of these youths later at the police station, and they would assume that I, too, was a homosexual. One of them exposed his private parts to me and said, Hey, Pops, you want some of this? Come get it. Yum, 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 and so on. But my point is that the police could not come and get me for nearly an hour. So Mary Kathleen and I had a nice long talk. She felt safe in this place. She dared to be sane. It was most touching. Only her body was decrepit. Her voice, and the soul it implied, might well have belonged still to what she used to be, an angrily optimistic 18-year-old. Everyone is going to be all right now, she said to me in the showroom of the American Harp Company. Something always told me that it would turn out this way. All's well that ends well, she said. What a fine mind she had. What fine minds all the four women I've loved have had. During the months I more or less lived with Mary Kathleen, she read all the books I had read or pretended to have read as a Harvard student. Those volumes had been chores to me, but they were a cannibal feast to Mary Kathleen. She read my books the way a young cannibal might eat the hearts of brave old enemies. Their magic would become hers. She said of my library one time, The greatest books in the world, taught by the wisest men in the world, at the greatest university in the world, to the smartest students in the world. Peace. And contrast Mary Kathleen, if you will, with my wife Ruth, the Ophelia of the death camps, who believed that even the most intelligent human beings were so stupid that they could only make things worse by speaking their minds. It was thinkers, after all, who had set up the death camps. Setting up a death camp with its railroad sidings and its around-the-clock crematoria was not something a moron could do. Neither could a moron explain why a death camp was ultimately humane. Again, peace. So there Mary Kathleen and I were, among all those harps. They are very strange instruments now that I think about them, and not very far from poor Ruth's idea of civilization even in peacetime. Impossible marriages between Greek columns and Leonardo da Vinci's flying machines. Harps are self-destructive, incidentally. When I found myself in the harp business at Ramjack, I had hoped that American Harp had among its assets some wonderful old harps that would turn out to be as valuable as Stradivari's and the Amatis violins. There was zero chance of this dream's coming true. The tensions in a harp are so tremendous and unrelenting that it becomes unplayable after fifty years and belongs on a dump or in a museum. I discovered something fascinating about prothonotary warblers, too. They are the only birds that are housebroken in captivity. You would think that the harps would have to be protected from bird droppings by canopies, but not at all. The warblers deposit their droppings in teacups that are set around. In a state of nature, evidently, they deposit their droppings in other birds' nests. That is what they think the teacups are. Live and learn. But back to Mary Kathleen and me among all those harps with the prothonotary warblers overhead and the police on their way. After my husband died, Walter, she said, I became so unhappy and lost that I turned to alcohol. That husband would have been Jack Graham, the reclusive engineer who had founded the Ramjack Corporation. He had not built the company from scratch. He had been born a multimillionaire. So far as I knew, of course, she might have been talking about a plumber or a truck driver or a college professor or anyone. She told about going to a private sanitarium in Louisville, Kentucky, where she was given shock treatments. These blasted all her memories from 1935 until 1955. That would explain why she thought she could still trust me now. Her memories of how callously I had left her and of my later betrayal of Leland Clues and all that had been burned away. She was able to believe that I was still the fiery idealist I had been in 1935. She had missed my part in Watergate. Everybody had missed my part in Watergate. I had to make up a lot of memories, she went on, just to fill up all the empty spaces. There had been a war, I knew, and I remembered how much you hated fascism. I saw you on a beach somewhere, on your back, in a uniform with a rifle and with the water rushing gently around you. Your eyes were wide open, Walter, because you were dead. You were staring straight up at the sun. We were silent for a moment. 
A yellow bird far above us warbled as though its heart would break. The song of a prothonotary warbler is notoriously monotonous, as I am the first to admit. I am not about to risk the credibility of my entire tale by claiming that prothonotary warblers rival the Boston Pops Orchestra with their songs. Still, they are capable of expressing heartbreak, within strict limits, of course. I've had the same dream of myself, I said. Many's the time, Mary Kathleen, that I wished it were true. No, 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 she protested. Thank God you're still alive. Thank God there's somebody still alive who cares what happens to this country. I thought maybe I was the last one. I've wandered this city for years now, Walter, saying to myself, they've all died off, the ones who cared, and then there you were. Mary Kathleen, I said, you should know that I just got out of prison. Of course you did, she said. All the good people go to prison all the time. Oh, thank God you're still alive. We will remake this country and then the world. I couldn't do it by myself, Walter. No, I wouldn't think so, I said. I've just been hanging on for dear life, she said. I haven't been able to do anything but survive. That's how alone I've been. I don't need much help, but I do need some. I know the problem, I said. I can still see enough to write. If I write big, she said, but I can't read the stories in newspapers anymore. My eyes. She said she sneaked into bars and department stores and motel lobbies to listen to the news on television, but that the sets were almost never turned to the news. Sometimes she would hear a snatch of news on somebody's portable radio, but the person owning it usually switched to music as soon as the news began. Remembering the news I had heard that morning about the police dog that ate a baby, I told her she wasn't really missing much. How can I make sensible plans, she said, if I don't know what's going on? You can't, I said. How can you base a revolution on Lawrence Welk and Sesame Street and All in the Family, she said. All these shows were sponsored by Ramjack. You can't, I said. I need solid information, she said. Of course you do, I said. We all do. It's all such crap, she said. I find this magazine called People in Garbage Cans, she said. But it isn't about people. It's about crap. This all seemed so pathetic to me that a shopping bag lady hoped to plan her scuttlings about the city and her snoozes among ash cans on the basis of what publications and radio and television could tell her about what was really going on. It seemed pathetic to her, too. Jackie Onassis and Frank Sinatra and Cookie Munster and Archie Bunker make their moves, she said, and then I study what they have done, and then I decide what Mary Kathleen O'Looney had better do. But now I have you, she said. You can be my eyes and my brains. Your eyes, maybe, I said. I haven't distinguished myself in the brains department recently. Oh, if only Kenneth Whistler were alive, too, she said. She might as well have said, if only Donald Duck were alive, too. Kenneth Whistler was a labor organizer who had been my idol in the old days, but I felt nothing about him now, had not thought about him for years. What a trio we would make, she went on. You and me and Kenneth Whistler. Whistler would have been a bum, too, by now, I supposed, if posed, if he hadn't died in a Kentucky mine disaster in 1941. He had insisted on being a worker as well as a labor organizer, and would have found modern union officials with their soft pink palms intolerable. I had shaken hands with him. His palm had felt like the back of a crocodile. The lines in his face had had so much coal dust worked into them that they looked like black tattoos. Strangely enough, this was a Harvard man, class of 1921. Well, said Mary Kathleen, at least there's still us and now we can start to make our move. I'm always open to suggestions, I said. Or maybe it isn't worth it, she said. She was talking about rescuing the people of the United States from their economy, but I thought she was talking about life in general. So I said of life in general that it probably was worth it, but that it did seem to go on a little too long. My life would have been a masterpiece, for example, if I had died on a beach with a fascist bullet between my eyes. Maybe people just are no good anymore, she said. They all look so mean to me. They aren't like they were during the Depression. I don't see anybody being kind to anybody anymore. 
Nobody will even speak to me. She asked me if I had seen any acts of kindness anywhere. I reflected on this and I realized that I had encountered almost nothing but kindness since leaving prison. I told her so. Then it's the way I look, she said. This was surely so. There was a limit to how much reproachful ugliness most people could bear to look at, and Mary Kathleen and all her shopping bag sisters had exceeded that limit. She was eager to know about individual acts of kindness toward me, to have it confirmed that Americans could still be good-hearted. So I was glad to tell her about my first 24 hours as a free man, starting with the kindness shown to me by Clyde Carter, the guard, and then by Dr. Robert Fender, the supply clerk and science fiction writer. After that, of course, I was given a ride in a limousine by Cleveland Laws. Mary Kathleen exclaimed over these people, repeated their names to make sure she had them right. They're saints, she said, so there are still saints around. Thus encouraged, I embroidered on the hospitality offered to me by Dr. Israel Adel, the night clerk at the Arapaho, and then by the employees at the coffee shop of the Hotel Royalton on the following morning. I was not able to give her the name of the owner of the shop, but only the physical detail that set him apart from the populace. He had a French fried hand, I said. The saint with a French fried hand, she said wonderingly. Yes, I said. And you saw yourself, a man I thought was the worst enemy I had in the world. He was the tall, blue-eyed man with the sample case. You heard him say that he forgave me for everything I had done, and that I should have supper with him soon. Tell me his name again, she said. Leland Clues, I said. Saint Leland Clues, she said reverently. See how much you've helped me already? I never could have found out about all these good people for myself. Then she performed a minor mnemonic miracle, repeating all the names in chronological order. Clyde Carter, Dr. Robert Fender, Cleveland Laws, Israel Edel, The Man with the French Fried Hand, and Leland Clues. Mary Kathleen took off one of her basketball shoes. It wasn't the one containing the ink pad and her pens and paper and her will and all that. The shoe she took off was crammed with memorabilia. There were hypocritical love letters from me, as I've said, but she was particularly eager for me to see a snapshot of what she called my two favorite men. It was a picture of my one-time idol, Kenneth Whistler, the Harvard-educated labor organizer, shaking hands with a small and goofy-looking college boy. The boy was myself. I had ears like a loving cup. That was when the police finally came clumping in to get me. I'll rescue you, Walter, said Mary Kathleen. Then we'll rescue the world together. I was relieved to be getting away from her, frankly. I tried to seem regretful about our parting. Take care of yourself, Mary Kathleen, I said. It looks like this is goodbye. 17. I hung that snapshot of Kenneth Whistler and myself, taken in the autumn of 1935, dead center in the Great Depression, on my office wall at Ramjack, next to the circular about stolen clarinet parts. It was taken by Mary Kathleen, with my bellows camera, on the morning after we first heard Whistler speak. He had come all the way to Cambridge from Harlan County, Kentucky, where he was a miner and a union organizer, to address a rally whose purpose was to raise money and sympathy for the local chapter of the International Brotherhood of Abrasives and Adhesives Workers. The union was run by communists then. It is run by gangsters now. As a matter of fact, the start of my prison sentence overlapped with the end of one being served at Finletter by the lifetime president of the IBAAW. His 23-year-old daughter was running the union from her villa in the Bahamas while he was away. He was on the telephone to her all the time. He told me that the membership was almost entirely black and Hispanic now. It was lily white back in the 30s. Scandinavians mostly. I don't think a black or Hispanic would have been allowed to join back in the good old days. Times change. Whistler spoke at night. On the afternoon before he spoke, I made love to Mary Kathleen O'Looney for the first time. It was mixed up in our young minds somehow with the prospect of hearing and perhaps even touching a genuine saint. How better to present ourselves to him or to any holy person, I suppose, than as Adam and Eve, smelling strongly of apple juice. 
Mary Kathleen and I made love in the apartment of an associate professor of anthropology named Arthur von Strelitz. His specialty was the headhunters of the Solomon Islands. He spoke their language and respected their taboos. They trusted him. He was unmarried. His bed was unmade. His apartment was on the third floor of a frame house on Brattle Street. A footnote to history. Not only that house, but that very apartment would be used later as a set in a very popular motion picture called Love Story. It was released during my early days with the Nixon administration. My wife and I went to see it when it came to Chevy Chase. It was a made-up story about a wealthy Anglo-Saxon student who married a poor Italian student, much against his father's wishes. She died of cancer. The aristocratic father was played brilliantly by Ray Milland. He was the best thing in the movie. Ruth cried all through the movie. We sat in the back row of the theater for two reasons. So I could smoke, and so there wouldn't be anybody behind her to marvel at how fat she was. But I could not really concentrate on the story because I knew the apartment where so much of it was happening so well. I kept waiting for Arthur von Strelitz or Mary Kathleen O'Looney or even me to appear. Small world. Mary Kathleen and I had the place for a weekend. Von Strelitz had given me the key. He had then gone to visit some other German emigre friends on Cape Ann. He must have been about 30 then. He seemed old to me. He was born into an aristocratic family in Prussia. He was lecturing at Harvard when Hitler became dictator of Germany in the spring of 1933. He declined to go home. He applied for American citizenship instead. His father, who never communicated with him in any way, would command a corps of SS and die of pneumonia during the siege of Leningrad. I know how his father died since there was testimony about his father at the war crimes trials in Nuremberg, where I was in charge of housekeeping. Again, small world. His father, acting on written orders from Martin Bormann, who was tried in absentia in Nuremberg, caused to be executed all persons, civilian and military, taken prisoner during the siege. The intent was to demoralize the defenders of Leningrad. Leningrad, incidentally, was younger than New York City. Imagine that. Imagine a famous European city, full of imperial treasures and worth besieging, and yet much younger than New York. Arthur von Strelitz would never learn how his father died. He himself would be rowed ashore from an American submarine in the Solomon Islands as a spy while they were still occupied by the Japanese. He would never be heard of again. Peace. He thought it was urgent, I remember, that mankind and womankind be defined. Otherwise, he was sure they were doomed forever to be defined by the needs of institutions. He had mainly factories and armies in mind. He was the only man I ever knew who wore a monocle. Now, Mary Kathleen O'Looney, age 18, lay in his bed. We had just made love. It would be very pretty to paint her as naked now, a pink little body. But I never saw her naked. She was modest. Never could I induce her to take off all her clothes. I myself stood stark naked at a window, with my private parts just below the sill. I felt like the great god Thor. Do you love me, Walter? Mary Kathleen asked my bare backside. What could I reply but this? Of course I do. There was a knock at the door. I had told my co-editor at the Bay State Progressive where I could be found in case of emergency. Who is it? I said. There was a sound like a little gasoline engine on the other side of the door. It was Alexander Hamilton McCone, my mentor who had decided to come to Cambridge unannounced to see what sort of life I was leading on his money. He sounded like a motor because of his stammer. He stammered because of the Cuyahoga Massacre in 1894. He was trying to say his own name. 18. I had somehow neglected to tell him that I had become a communist. Now he had found out about that. He had come first to my room in Adam's house, where he was told that I was most likely at the Progressive. He had gone to the Progressive and had ascertained what sort of publication it was and that I was its co-editor. Now he was outside the door with a copy folded under his arm. 
I remained calm. Such was the magic of having emptied my seminal vesicles so recently. Mary Kathleen, obeying my silent arm signals, hid herself in the bathroom. I slipped on a robe belonging to von Strelitz. He had brought it home from the Solomon Islands. It appeared to be made of shingles, with wreaths of feathers at its collar and cuffs. Thus was I clad when I opened the door and said to old Mr. McCone, who was in his early sixties then, Come in, come in. He was so angry with me that he could only continue to make those motor sounds. But, 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 but. but he meanwhile did a grotesque pantomime of how repulsed he was by the paper, whose front page cartoon showed a bloated capitalist who looked just like him, by my costume, by the unmade bed, by the picture of Karl Marx on von Strelitz's wall. Out he went again, slamming the door behind him. He was through with me. Thus did my childhood end at last. I had become a man. And it was as a man that I went that night, with Mary Kathleen on my arm, to hear Kenneth Whistler speak at the rally for my comrades in the International Brotherhood of Abrasives and Adhesives Workers. How could I be so serene? So confident? My tuition for the year had already been paid, so I would graduate. I was about to get a full scholarship to Oxford. I had a superb wardrobe in good repair. I had been saving most of my allowance so that I had a small fortune in the bank. If I had to, I could always borrow money from mother. God rest her soul. What a daring young man I was. What a treacherous young man I was. I already knew that I would abandon Mary Kathleen at the end of the academic year. I would write her a few love letters and then fall silent after that. She was too low class. Whistler had a big bandage over one temple, and his right arm was in a plaster cast that night. This was a Harvard graduate, mind you, and from a good family in Cincinnati. He was a Buckeye, like me. Mary Kathleen and I supposed that he had been beat up by the forces of evil yet again, by the police, or the National Guard, or by goons of organizers of yellow dog unions. I held Mary Kathleen's hand. Nobody had ever told her he loved her before. I was wearing a suit and a necktie, and so were most of the men there. We wanted to show that we were as decent and sober citizens as anyone. Kenneth Whistler might have been a businessman. He had even found time to shine his shoes. Those used to be important symbols of self-respect. Shined shoes. Whistler began his speech by making fun of his bandages. The spirit of 76, he said. Everybody laughed and laughed, although the occasion was surely not a happy one. All the members of the union had been fired about a month before, for joining a union. They were makers of grinding wheels, and there was only one company in the area that could use their skills. That was the Johansson Grinder Company, and that was the company that had fired them. They were specialized potters, essentially, shaping soft materials and then firing them in kilns. The fathers or grandfathers of most of them had actually been potters in Scandinavia who were brought to this country to learn this new specialty. The rally took place in a vacant store in Cambridge. Appropriately enough, the folding chairs had been contributed by a funeral home. Mary Kathleen and I were in the first row. Whistler, it turned out, had been injured in a routine mining accident. He said he had been working as a robber, taking out support pillars of coal from a tunnel where the seam had otherwise been exhausted. Something had fallen on him. And he went seamlessly from talk of such dangerous work in such a dark place to a recollection of a tea dance at the Ritz fifteen years before, where a Harvard classmate named Niles Johansson had been caught using loaded dice in a crap game in the men's room. This was the same person who was now the president of Johansson Grinder, who had fired all these workers. Johansson's grandfather had started the company. He said that Johansson had had his head stuck in a toilet bowl at the Ritz, and that the hope was that he would never use loaded dice again. But here he is, said Whistler, using loaded dice again. He said that Harvard could be held responsible for many atrocities, including the executions of Sacco and Vansetti but that it was innocent of having produced Niles Johansson. He never attended a lecture, never wrote a paper, 
never read a book while he was there, he said. He was asked to leave at the end of his sophomore year. Oh, I pity him, he said. I even understand him. How else could he ever amount to anything if he did not use loaded dice? How has he used loaded dice with you? The laws that say he can fire anybody who stands up for the basic rights of workers. Those are loaded dice. The policeman who will protect his property rights, but not your human rights. Those are loaded dice. Whistler asked the fired workers how much Johansson actually knew or cared about grinding wheels. How shrewd this was. The way to befriend working people in those days, and to get them to criticize their society as brilliantly as any philosopher, was to get them to talk about the one subject on which they were almost arrogantly well informed. Their work. It was something to hear. Worker after worker testified that Johansson's father and grandfather had been mean bastards too, but that they at least knew how to run a factory. Raw materials of the highest quality arrived on time in their day. Machinery was properly maintained. The heating plant and the toilets worked. Bad workmanship was punished and good workmanship was rewarded. No defective grinding wheel ever reached a customer, and on and on. Whistler asked them if one of their own number could run the factory better than Niles Johansson did. One man spoke for them all on that subject. God, yes, he said. Anyone here. Whistler asked him if he thought it was right that a person could inherit a factory. The man's considered answer was this. Not if he's afraid of the factory and everybody in it. Nope. No siree. This piece of groping wisdom impresses me still. A sensible prayer people could offer up from time to time, it seems to me, might go something like this. Dear Lord, never put me in the charge of a frightened human being. Kenneth Whistler promised us that the time was at hand for workers to take over their factories and to run them for the benefit of mankind. Profits that now went to drones and corrupt politicians would go to those who worked, and to the old and the sick and the orphaned. All people who could work would work. There would be only one social class, the working class. Everyone would take turns doing the most unpleasant work, so that a doctor, for example, might be expected to spend a week out of each year as a garbage man. The production of luxury goods would stop until the basic needs of every citizen were met. Healthcare would be free. Food would be cheap and nourishing and plentiful. Mansions and hotels and office buildings would be turned into small apartments until everyone was decently housed. Dwellings would be assigned by means of a lottery. There would be no more wars and eventually no more national boundaries since everyone in the world would belong to the same class with identical interests, the interests of the working class, and on and on. What a spellbinder he was. Mary Kathleen whispered in my ear. You're going to be just like him, Walter. I'll try, I said. I had no intention of trying. The most embarrassing thing to me about this autobiography, surely, is its unbroken chain of proofs that I have never been a serious man. I have been in a lot of trouble over the years, but that was all accidental. Never have I risked my life, or even my comfort, in the service of mankind. Shame on me. People who had heard Kenneth Whistler speak before begged him to tell again about leading the pickets outside Charlestown Prison when Sacco and Vansetti were executed. And it seems strange to me now that I have to explain who Sacco and Vansetti were. I recently asked young Israel Edel at Ramjack, the former night clerk at the Arapaho, what he knew about Sacco and Vansetti, and he told me confidently that they were rich, brilliant thrill killers from Chicago. He had confused them with Leopold and Loeb. Why should I find this unsettling? When I was a young man, I expected the story of Sacco and Vansetti to be retold as often and as movingly, to be as irresistible as the story of Jesus Christ someday. Weren't modern people, if they were to marvel creatively at their own lifetimes, I thought, entitled to a passion like Sacco and Vansetti's, which ended in an electric chair? As for the last days of Sacco and Vansetti as a modern passion, as on Golgotha, three lower-class men were executed at the same time by a state. 
This time, though, not just one of the three was innocent. This time, two of the three were innocent. The guilty man was a notorious thief and killer named Celestino Medieros, convicted of a separate crime. As the end drew near, he confessed to the murders for which Sacco and Vansetti had been convicted too. Why? I had seen Sacco's wife come here with the kids, and I felt sorry for the kids, he said. Imagine those lines spoken by a good actor in a modern passion play. Madieros died first. The lights of the prison dimmed three times. Sacco died next. Of the three, he was the only family man. The actor portraying him would have to project a highly intelligent man who, since English was his second language and since he was not clever with languages, would not trust himself to say anything complicated to the witnesses as he was strapped into the electric chair. Long live anarchy, he said. Farewell, my wife and child, and all my friends, he said. Good evening, gentlemen, he said. Farewell, mother, he said. This was a shoemaker. The lights of the prison dimmed three times. Vansetti was the last. He sat down in the chair in which Madieros and Sacco had died before anyone could indicate that this was what he was expected to do. He began to speak to the witnesses before anybody could tell him that he was free to do this. English was his second language too, but he could make it do whatever he pleased. Listen to this. I wish to tell you, he said, that I am an innocent man. I never committed any crime, but sometimes some sin. I am innocent of all crime, not only this one, but all crime. I am an innocent man. He had been a fish peddler at the time of his arrest. I wish to forgive some people for what they are now doing to me, he said. The lights of the prison dimmed three times. The story, yet again. Sacco and Vansetti never killed anybody. They arrived in America from Italy, not knowing each other, in 1908. It was the same year in which my parents arrived. Father was 19, mother was 21. Sacco was 17, Vansetti was 20. American employers at that time wanted the country to be flooded with labor that was cheap and easily cowed, so that they could keep wages down. Vansetti would say later, in the immigration station, I had my first surprise. I saw the steerage passengers handled by the officials like so many animals. Not a word of kindness, of encouragement, to lighten the burden of tears that rest heavily upon the newly arrived on American shores. Father and mother used to tell me much the same thing. They, too, were made to feel like fools who had somehow gone to great pains to deliver themselves to a slaughterhouse. My parents were recruited at once by an agent of the Cuyahoga Bridge and Iron Company in Cleveland. He was instructed to hire only blonde Slavs, Mr. McCone once told me, on his father's theory that blondes would have the mechanical ingenuity and robustness of Germans, but tempered with the passivity of Slavs. The agent was to pick up factory workers and a few presentable domestic servants for the various McCone households as well. Thus did my parents enter the servant class. Sacco and Vansetti were not so lucky. There was no broker in human machinery who had a requisition for shapes like theirs. Where was I to go? What was I to do? wrote Vansetti. Here was the promised land. The elevated rattled by and did not answer. The automobiles and the trolleys sped by heedless of me. So he and Sacco, still separately and in order not to starve to death, had to begin at once to beg in broken English for any sort of work at any wage going from door to door. Time passed. Sacco, who had been a shoemaker in Italy, found himself welcome in a shoe factory in Milford, Massachusetts, a town where, as chance would have it, Mary Kathleen O'Looney's mother was born. Sacco got himself a wife and a house with a garden. They had a son named Dante and a daughter named Inez. Sacco worked six days a week, ten hours each day. He also found time to speak out and give money and take part in demonstrations for workers on strike for better wages and more humane treatment at work and so on. He was arrested for such activities in 1916. 
Vansetti had no trade and so went from job to job, in restaurants, in a quarry, in a steel mill, in a rope factory. He was an ardent reader. He studied Marx and Darwin and Hugo and Gorky and Tolstoy and Zola and Dante. That much he had in common with Harvard men. In 1916, he led a strike against the rope factory which was the Plymouth Cordage Company in Plymouth, Massachusetts, now a subsidiary of Ramjack. He was blacklisted by places of work far and wide after that, and became a self-employed peddler of fish to survive. And it was in 1916 that Sacco and Vansetti came to know each other well. It became evident to both of them, thinking independently, but thinking always of the brutality of business practices, that the battlefields of World War I were simply additional places of hideously dangerous work, where a few men could supervise the wasting of millions of lives in the hopes of making money. It was clear to them, too, that America would soon become involved, that they did not wish to be compelled to work in such factories in Europe. So they both joined the same small group of Italian-American anarchists that went to Mexico until the war was over. Anarchists are persons who believe with all their hearts that governments are enemies of their own people. I find myself thinking even now that the story of Sacco and Vansetti may yet enter the bones of future generations. Perhaps it needs to be told only a few more times. If so, then the flight into Mexico will be seen by one and all as yet another expression of a very holy sort of common sense. Be that as it may, Sacco and Vansetti returned to Massachusetts after the war, fast friends. Their sort of common sense, holy or not, and based on books Harvard men read routinely and without ill effects, had always seemed contemptible to most of their neighbors. Those same neighbors, and those who liked to guide their destinies without much opposition, now decided to be terrified by that common sense, especially when it was possessed by the foreign-born. The Department of Justice drew up secret lists of foreigners who made no secret whatsoever about how unjust and self-deceiving and ignorant and greedy they thought so many of the leaders were in the so-called Promised Land. Sacco and Vansetti were on the list. They were shadowed by government spies. A printer named Andrea Salcedo, who was a friend of Vansetti's, was also on the list. He was arrested in New York City by federal agents on unspecified charges and held incommunicado for eight weeks. On May 3rd of 1920, Salcedo fell or jumped or was pushed out of the 14th-story window of an office maintained by the Department of Justice. Sacco and Vansetti organized a meeting that was to demand an investigation of the arrest and death of Salcedo. It was scheduled for May 9th in Brockton, Massachusetts, Mary Kathleen O'Looney's hometown. Mary Kathleen was then six years old. I was seven. Sacco and Vansetti were arrested for dangerous radical activities before the meeting could take place. Their crime was the possession of leaflets calling for the meeting. The penalties could be stiff fines and up to a year in jail. But then they were suddenly charged with two unsolved murders, too. Two payroll guards had been shot dead during a robbery in South Braintree, Massachusetts, about a month before. The penalties for that, of course, would be somewhat stiffer, would be two painless deaths in the same electric chair. <laughs>